Coming up, major lifestyle brand, 8th Generation, has a new leader. Plus, we meet a native law professor at Stanford University. And it's official, the Washington football team has a new name. We'll tell you what it took to get here. I am Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. Working with award-winning professors, Cronkite students learn news reporting, social media, shooting and editing videos, and producing content for communications industries. Cronkite's 15 professional programs give students the opportunity to cover critical issues throughout the U.S. and beyond. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Thank you for joining us. Officials from various Native nations are wrapping up a meeting with high-level policymakers. On Monday, the White House Council on Native American Affairs held an engagement session with tribal leaders. Interior Secretary Deb Holland and Ambassador Susan Rice led the meeting as co-chairs of the council. While the session was closed to the press, the Interior Department said the meeting gave tribal leaders information on how to implement infrastructure investments made by the federal government. It also included information on how to improve public safety. Navajo President Jonathan Nez participated in the discussion and described the gathering as a step in the right direction. He said many of the projects funded by the bipartisan infrastructure law will take years to come to fruition and welcomes continued conversations with policymakers. Also present at the virtual gathering were various cabinet secretaries, including Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg and Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm. The remains of Wiat tribal citizens are finally being returned home. At the end of last year, the remains of at least 20 people and more than 100 funerary objects were returned to the Wiat tribe located in Northern California. The remains came from the Indian Island Massacre. The massacre happened in February of 1860 when Wiat women, children, and elders were killed by a band of white men during their tribe's world renewal ceremony. For 70 years, their remains were stored at the University of California, Berkeley, after they were discovered near a waterway in Eureka. The group of men who committed the act were never held accountable. One of those included Bret Hart, who was a popular writer in the newspaper The Northern Californian. The Wiat tribe says they are grateful for the repatriation, saying their ancestors can be at peace and will be able to reunite with their families. Activist Leonard Peltier tested positive for COVID in a federal prison. Members of his support group reported his diagnosis last Friday. Peltier is 77 and is serving time in Tampa Bay, Florida. He was convicted of killing two FBI agents in a 1975 shootout on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. On Monday, the International Leonard Peltier Defense Committee spoke about his COVID-19 diagnosis. The group claimed that Peltier said guards were coming into the prison with COVID-19 and not enforcing masks or isolation protocols for the inmates. Right now we show that 20 guards in the Bureau of Prisons, USB 1, up in Coleman, have COVID. They're bringing it in and they're giving it to the inmates. They're not giving the inmates the proper precautions. They might have them in place, but they're not enforcing them. They're, they're accountable for this. He got COVID because of them and their negligence. The group criticized the prison's alleged lack of urgency in getting Peltier proper care. They say he is currently isolated and will be transferred to a hospital if his condition worsens. We want Leonard in a hospital immediately. He has an Aerotic aneurysm. I mean, he's very high risk. He's a diabetic. Why does he have to be treated like a less than human? All the people that have dark skin, we know what we're talking about. And we're tired of it. We really are. 
Many believe Peltier was falsely convicted, which is why the group also called on President Joe Biden to release Peltier from prison. A major rugby club in England is rebranding itself away from native imagery. Last week, the Exeter Chiefs announced it will keep its nickname but will replace its logo. The previous logo included a depiction of a native-themed warrior. Now the new logo will be based on Celtic culture. Critics of the team previously described headdresses and the team's tomahawk chants as dehumanizing. A group called the Exeter Chiefs for Change called on the team to get rid of names like Wigwam and Mohawk at stalls and bars in the club's stadium. The group also added, Indigenous peoples have long said they are not respected nor honored by the native imagery, and scientific studies have shown it contributes to some of the ongoing challenges Indigenous peoples face, so we're relieved that those concerns have been listened to and acted upon. The new logo will officially be launched in July of this year. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Coming up, we meet the new leader at 8th Generation. Plus, we meet a history-making law professor and football. Stay with us. There is new leadership at 8th Generation, a Seattle-based art and lifestyle brand owned by the Snoqualmie tribe. 8th Generation provides a strong ethical alternative to Native-inspired. Its inspired natives offer 100% Native-designed products. Its new CEO, CEO joins us today. Colleen Echohawk has served as the executive director of the Chief Seattle Club and is on the Seattle Community Police Commission. She was a mayoral candidate for the city of Seattle last year. Congratulations, Colleen, and welcome to the newscast. Well, thank you so much. I am delighted to be here and really excited to talk with you today. I'm really curious, what prompted you to make such a career change into becoming the new CEO of 8th Generation? Well, it's a great question, and I'm really glad to get to share with you that, you know, my career path has been about supporting you know, Native folks who were really struggling in the city of Seattle. Um, we have very, very high rates of Native people experiencing homelessness, and I um, was very fortunate to serve them at the Chief Seattle Club. But one, one thing that kind of just continued to bother me and feel not quite right is that we know that there are many factors that that are that contribute to someone experiencing homelessness. And we really need to be ensure that our native community, our native families, our brothers, our sisters, our relatives, that, that we are building prosperity within our families. And so that we don't have um, these huge rates of um, folks experiencing homelessness. We know that the racial wealth gap here in this country is terrible. We know that we're barely moving the needle. And so I saw eighth generation as an opportunity to continue my passion to build prosperity in the native communities, to see our families, our relatives thriving. And um, you know, eighth generation is just such an exciting company. We have 75% of our staff are native, we're owned by a tribe, and I want to see eighth generation explode into every market so that we um are our, our building prosperity within our communities. And I understand that one of the core values of eighth generation is to give back and especially to the community that you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. You know, eighth generation um, ever, you know, so it was founded by my friend Louis Gong, right? So um, throughout the whole, you know, building of eighth generation for the past years, you know, Louis Gong and the team here at Eighth Generation have continued to support and give back to the community, including our wool blankets, which there's one right behind me here. And we're kind of, that's one of our, our key products. And I have gotten to see folks who've been experiencing homelessness, just their, their smiles and the joy that they have when Louis and the team would drop off um, you know, boxes of wool blankets for folks. Um, and so we can we will continue that here at Eighth Generation, continue supporting um, our communities, continue supporting um, communities here in Seattle, but also across the country as we become more of a, a national and then we hope to be a, a global brand. 
eighth generation actually has a retail store for someone who's never been there. I've actually never had the chance to go there yet. Sort of describe what that's like, the, the atmosphere, the community, what's around it and sort of, you know, what stands out to you about the retail store? Well, one of the really key and important things is that it is actually in the very famous Pike Place Market, which is one of our more um, well-known places here in Seattle. And so it's a very vibrant, it feels really um, cool and fun. And you walk into our store and you are just enveloped with warmth and with native um, design and art and products that can be really um, just exciting. I, I know that um, when my kiddos would go into that store, they felt so connected to who they are as native people. I can remember, you know, pulling open my um, cupboard as a child and there was not, you know, mugs with native designs. There was not towels that were native designed. It was, you know, we didn't, I didn't have that. Um, you know, as a child 40 years ago. And so I think it's just when you walk into our store, um, you kind of just and feel enveloped with the um, Native community and with Native, authentic Native art and design. And that's really important because we know that much, um, a lot of Native art and design has been co-opted by non-Native people and they call it Native inspired art. And we we really want to take that back and make sure that, that um, Native artists are getting, you know, the money they deserve from that, and we are continuing to evolve and support um, Native artists. So our retail store is super fun. We hope that you, when anyone um, is in Seattle, that they come down and check us out and um, just be part of that community with us. Colleen, we only have a short time left together, but I'm very curious to hear in your own words, um, what goals do you have for this company? Well, we, we get to grow. We get to grow and grow and grow. And part of that is building up our infrastructure, um, building out our inventory um, and making sure that we are ready for that growth. We are talking to um, big brands. We are wanting to be, you know, we want to be out there. And, and most, most important for me is that I want this brand to continue to um, lift up Native artists, lift up that design, and also bring, push, put the money back into their pockets. And so, so to me, that is one way that we will continue to build prosperity within our communities, thriving communities. Um, and, and, um, and, and then the final thing that's so exciting is to know that um, authentic Native art and design will be out there for anyone. I think that there's a lot of people, Native and non-Native, who want to, to buy that. And I think that it's just um, incredible opportunity. Um, and then I want to see our staff. I have so many goals, but the, 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 I want to see our staff. I want to see the Suquamish tribe just like thriving and succeeding. And this business is a part of that. Colleen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And we'll be right back. Up until last year, Stanford University's law school had never had a Native faculty member. That is, until they hired Elizabeth Reese in January 2021 as an assistant professor. She joins us now to share more about her journey. Hi, Professor Reese. Hi, good morning. For our viewers who are meeting you for the first time, tell us more about yourself. Well, Navito Ahawi Mpovi, Nave Americana Hawa Elizabeth Reese, Na Name Wenge Weang Amu. So, hello, my name is Elizabeth Reese uh, Yampovi, and I'm from Nambe Pueblo. Um, I am a law professor, <laughs> newly appointed at uh, Stanford University, where I teach about tribal law, federal Indian law, constitutional law, and civil rights law. When you were hired, I'm really curious, how did it sort of impact you to be the first Native law professor? I knew that that was... Uh, very likely at a lot of the different institutions that I was, you know, considering working at. Um, you know, there's still a lot of places where, you know, firsts are coming for Native people. Um, and, you know, I think that it's, you know, particularly significant for Indian country. I think we all know that the law is very important to our survival, that law touches the lives of Native people in very intimate ways, you know, maybe more than a lot of other Americans. 
um, and that knowing the law and wielding it can be a really powerful tool for us. Um, and while there's been a very strong tradition of Indian law, particularly at some of the public institutions in the West, um, you know, some of these more elite private institutions uh, have traditionally not been dominated by, you know, particularly native faculty members. And so I knew that this would be a really big deal and something that would be particularly exciting for Indian country uh, to have a native person uh, at one of those institutions in particular. You know, something that really strikes me is the fact that Stanford had never had a native law faculty member, but the legacy of native attorneys to come from Stanford is a long list. One of the ones that stands out to me is Hillary Tompkins, who is the former solicitor of the Department of Interior. And so it seems like in a lot of ways, you're sort of continuing this legacy that was built from students. Yes, absolutely. And you know, I feel incredibly lucky to be joining just this in legacy at Stanford generally, not just at the law school, um, but at the university broadly. Stanford has this rich history and tradition of native representation, particularly within the student body, um, and then has gone on to produce incredible leaders just like Hillary. Um, and so to be, you know, joining that and, you know, providing education and support on the faculty side you know, I couldn't, I couldn't ask for a better place to be building my career and really, you know, a better community to be, to be joining. I think, um, you know, especially as far as, you know, an institution where it might make sense to have uh, a professor like me, um, Stanford is fantastic. What exactly does a law professor at Stanford do? <laughs> well, uh, you know, first and foremost, I am a teacher. So I teach a variety of different courses um, in tribal law, uh, constitutional law, uh, civil rights law. Um, uh, we also uh, work with different tribes. Um, you know, since I, you know, I'm a specialist, particularly in tribal law, we partner with different um, tribes and offer, you know, kind of cl a clinical-like experience where we um, let students uh, provide sort of legal type services um, to some of the tribal communities um, to help them with some of the issues that they might be working through. Cause it's a great experience for the students and also of course, really helpful for the tribal communities. Um, but then of course, aside from this teaching responsibility, it's also um, my role to kind of be a public intellectual, to be kind of an expert on the various things that I research and teach on um, and having um, I think particularly a native voice uh, in that sort of expert pool uh, to talk about legal issues that impact Indian country, uh, particularly, you know, things like Supreme Court decisions, um, I think can, has been already really valuable. Uh, there's insights that I have about how things might play out, you know, on the ground, on the res <laughs> that, um, uh, might have been overlooked in the past um, if folks had maybe not been calling up an expert who um, understood both the law and that lived experience. Let's actually go there. We're in a situation right now where President Biden is choosing his next, well, his first actually Supreme Court justice. Um, what are your thoughts so far on how, on how that process has played out and, you know, where do you think we'll end up? So I, you know, I, I think a lot of attention has been um, paid towards the campaign promise that he made to appoint a black woman. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I'm glad to see that he has made that commitment. I think diversifying the Supreme Court bench even further is uh, incredible and important. Um, one of the things that I think is really wrong about that, the, the coverage of that so far is I think folks tend to frame it as something about identity politics. Um, and I don't think it's about identity politics exclusively. I think it's about people's identity actually having um, meaning and being an asset to the bench um, in a way that can have uh, real value to being a good judge um, and bring insights to the law. So uh, I really look forward to having an African-American woman on the bench. I think she'll, um, you know, particularly bring back some things that um, 
have been have been missing from some of the decisions for for a while. Well, Assistant Professor of Law at Stanford University, Elizabeth Reese, thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll be right back. Well, it's official. The Washington football team has a new name. The franchise is now known as the Commanders. We've asked political commentator Holly Cook Macaro to give us some context for this new name. She's a partner with Spirit Rock Consulting. Welcome, Holly. Thank you, Aaliyah. Let's talk about this years-long effort from Indigenous activists to get this name changed. Uh, give us some of the background. There's, there's some discussion about uh, you know, is this a victory? Is this enough? What does this mean really to Indian country? As we watch um, the fanfare around the Washington professional football team, which I've taken to calling them over the, over the last decades, um, as we watch them announce their new name, which has been a, a painful process over the, over the last, um, I guess it's been a year since since they made the announcement. So I would say that unequivocally, this is this is a victory. This is a victory for our tribal community, and it's a victory for Suzanne Harjo of the Morning Star Institute, who um, relentlessly carried this story, carried this 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 piece for so long. It's a victory for Carla Fredericks, who um, you know who put pressure on the investors on this on the sponsors through First uh, First People's Fund. It's a victory for Amanda Blackhorse, who led led the plaintiffs in in the lawsuit. All of these things came together. And, and we saw Dr. Stephanie Freiberg from the University of Michigan, who, you know, sometimes our scholars toil in, in anonymity, but Dr. Freiberg put together the data that countered all of the messages that repetitively came at Indian country about why these names didn't matter. But her data really gave us that, gave us the, the, the power to counter those the, and, um, and the argument. And of course, Crystal Echohawk at Illuminative, who saw the, the, the political opportunities, the, the PR opportunities, saw the moment in time where we could make our most powerful argument um, and through Illuminative, you know, became a very strong voice in getting this across the finish line. So I, I, I say, yes, this is unequivocally a victory. But is there something more? I know that Amanda Blackhorse has expressed some frustration that it's it's more than just a sorry that that um, should be offered to both the tribal communities and to those who were on the front lines of this. And I tend to agree. Daniel Snyder was not just um, uh, the the owner and the bearer of that name, but he had a very in your face attitude at at so many turns. Um, in this, and so I, I do think that there should be a recognition by the team of of the of um, that behavior and of those who were really on the front lines and took a lot of that heat. But today is is a good day. We are we are seeing we are seeing I think what was you know the the headline gone and really gives us a little oomph as we um, work towards taking down the others as well. You brought up a really good point, and I've actually talked to a number of the people that you just mentioned in following this story over, you know, the last year and a half, it seems like, since Washington announced that they would change their name, and then they said, we don't have a name yet, but we're going to come out with a name. It's been a, a, a long process to get here. Um, I'm really curious to hear your perspective on how much getting pressure from investors was key in changing this name. Can you uh, reflect on that? I can. I think the 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 run up to this, we saw we saw the lawsuit. We saw a lot of the messaging, and I think it was always frustrating to Indian country where you know the infamous Washington Post poll, where they could find one Native American to say they were fine with it, to counter the thousands that had weighed in otherwise. That that always seemed um, to be the case. But I, I think you know smart heads got together. And you know what? What really matters to the fo to folks like Dan Snyder, the pocketbook, the bottom line. You know their team wasn't winning. That was always um, at each each um, successive losing season. Um, I think there was some credit given to the um, um, bad vibes from uh, for the lack of changing the name. But that pressure on the bottom line 
from the investors when Nike, when, uh, you know, the others, major names in the industries um, came out and said, we are backing off because we don't agree with what with what comes along and the connotations that come along with this name. And we are listening to Indian country. I think that was really probably what got us across the finish line along with the data and the arguments. We only have a very short time left together, Holly, but I'm really curious in the media coverage that's going to come from the Washington commanders today and in the coming days, how big of a question should it be to be interviewing the indigenous activists, as you said, who have paved this way for a very long time? It remains an important part. The, the, the response uh, on this is um, not just from, from the fans, right? A part of the story and how we got here today is a, was an opportunity to educate America about Indian country. And that should be part of the unveiling of the new name as well. Holly cook Macaro, thank you so much. Thank you, Aaliyah. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest updates, visit IndianCountryToday.com. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run, you got to run.